to continue our series on Romans tonight, but you get the joy and privilege of hearing from, how many of you are mechanical? Straight out of the mechanical department, Dr. Keith Nisbet tonight, so welcome him. So here's the, can you hear me with that bit if I move around? I need to stay close. Here's the interesting thing here. Y'all been working on a study. And down there in the schedule it says guest speaker. And y'all been talking about, you know, may the guest speaker tell you something useful tonight and things like that. And, and so here I am. I get dropped in right here in the middle of all this. And I have great confidence that it's going to work. I don't know what y'all have talked about so far in the first 10 chapters you've been through in this study, but I know that God knows, and that's the exciting thing. Here's the first test. What book of the New Testament are you been studying? Bibles or you got smartphones that have Bibles on them, pull them out. Let's go, let's look. Go to Romans chapter, do we know that? 11, okay. Romans chapter 11 where the key question that he starts with is, did God reject his people? But before we answer that, let's, let's give ourselves a little bit of context. Now you've been through, but I don't know what you've been through exactly. So I'm going to give you a, a, a condensed bus version of this last chapter and a half that, that has led into this. So if you go all the way back to Romans chapter 9, the first two, three or four verses, so go there in your book, and I'm not going to read all the verses, but just kind of give you the gist of it, assuming that you've been through this already. Okay, so here's Paul, and he's kind of like beating his breast out. Oh, man, the Israelite people, my heart is just pouring out for them. I wish I I wish I could be cut off and cursed myself if that would save them. It's a totally foolish thought, okay? It's not really what he means, but he's saying, these are my people. They are my race. These are the people of Israel. And so the next several ch chapters here, he's just pouring himself out with his thoughts for everywhere he went, he first went to the synagogue. And he almost always ended up leaving being beaten or slandered or kicked out of town or something, right? And we've read all that in Acts. They just, in general, rejected him and everything he's saying. And so his heart is crying out about this, even though he knows that God told him and Jesus told him when he first converted him with the bright light experience, you know, he basically says, I will show him what he has to, to suffer on my behalf as he goes to the Gentiles. But he's writing here, and he's pouring out his heart for this people. We'll go down to verse 4 and 5 there in chapter 9. And he describes the people that he is one of. And he says, theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs is the divine glory. Theirs are the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, the promises. And he just over and over. It's just, it's, this is the wonder of God's people, the patriarchs the human ancestry of Jesus himself, the Messiah that came from heavenly realm and is God himself. He came from this group of people. And he ends that verse with it. This is the God over all forever praised. Amen, right? This is the people that he's, his heart is anguished for. Why? Because they have rejected this Messiah as a whole, as a group, <coughs> their leaders, the, the, the elders amongst them, the priests amongst them, they had rejected and to the extent that they had him killed. Okay? And so what's he to think? What are we to think? If we're thinking about Israel, what are we to think in such a situation as this? Because it would seem that God had told them that it's through you that I'm going to bring this about. That it's through you people that I've chosen as a special people that we're going to teach, teach to the world. And yet they rejected him. Skipping down to verse 6 in Romans 9, he says, But it's not like God's word has failed. Hope. 
It's not like God's word has failed. Why? Because not all who descended from Israel are Israel. Now, I'm not sure how much you focus on this or not, so, so where you are on that, but what does that mean if not all who have descended from Israel are Israel? Well, if you look in the greater context of this, what he basically gets around to saying is, to be truly of Israel, you will be of the faith of Abraham. That's how you get credited as being truly one of these. So you can jump, you don't have to flip there, but ju- if over in Romans 11, which we'll get to, you'll get to next week, the latter part of the chapter, verse 25 and 26, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about this mystery. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. He's not saying by this happening that we get to go back and pick up all the ones that fell by the wayside. He's saying this is how we will find all Israel because true Israel will be all those with the faith of Abraham and therefore they are called as God's chosen people. This will be all of Israel. So he basically tells them, just kind of hints at it here back in chapter 9, that God's word hasn't failed because, uh, you know what, He's he's thinking a lot deeper than we are. We were thinking of a nation of people that had this little city that we've been struggling to try to hang on to and so forth. And the Romans currently are the big problem. But we'll come back as a nation. That's what they were thinking. And he said, no, God's got bigger plans. When he said, my people Israel, he really was talking about a a scope that included all who had the faith. That God said what he meant and did what he said. And that's the faith of the gospel message that we have. This is the true Israel that he's really talking about. And then bumping down to verse 27 of chapter 9, we find out that, you know, Israel really wasn't, as a nation, wasn't any better than the other nations out there. There were ways that they were. They worshiped God and the other nations didn't and things like that for times. But he basically said, it doesn't matter. Even if we'd had the Israelites were like the sand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved. That was in their scripture. They knew that was what God had already said about them. He promised Abraham that you can't count how many descendants you're going to have. But then he told Abraham, and all nations will be, your, will be blessed through your descendants. He didn't say, well, we're just going to build this group of people, and there are going to be a lot of them. What Paul just says here is God said, we're going to build this group of people, and there are only going to be a very few of them. But yet it's going to end up being more than you can count. Sand on the seashore, stars in the sky. You can't count how many Israel will end up being by the time he is finished. Verse 29, it's just as Isaiah said previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. He basically said, we, we deserve nothing better than Sodom and Gomorrah did. We think of them as those were the bad guys. Those are the really wicked sinners over there and so forth. But he said, no, we were the same. And unless... God had left us a remnant. This is that term again. Unless he had done something, we would not, any of us, have been left. Now that's a key point because if God had just taken his people Israel and just made this nation, and this nation is the way that salvation happens and it can only come to him by this one little group of people, what do you think the gospel is based on then? It's them. It's through them, and it's only that way you get there. And he said, no, nope, they deserve to be rained on with, with its brimstone and, and be destroyed just like Sodom and Gomorrah. They didn't deserve it any more than any of the heathens out there that they were looking down upon. It's only by God's grace. And so Romans 9.30, he says, what should we say? The Gentiles, who did not even know about righteousness, they didn't pursue righteousness, they found it. How? Because they found a righteousness that is by faith. Define righteousness as being right in the sight of God. When you stand before God, what condition are you in? If he says, you're good, then you're righteous. But you all probably have a little insight to know that when, he sa- when you stand before God, he doesn't say you're good because you did a lot of good things, right? Your righteousness is based on when he says, what do you guys say for yourself? You say, I, I believe in Jesus. There's your answer because you say, that's righteous. Because Jesus is right in the sight of God, and he has declared the only way for you to be right is to believe that. And when you believe that, that's by faith. That's what he's credited to Abraham. Believe what God says, and that's righteousness. But then verse 31, he said, but the people of Israel, they pursued righteousness all the day long. They were trying their hardest to be righteous, to be the righteous people. 
to stand before God with righteousness. And he said they didn't get their goal. Why? They didn't know God's righteousness. Because God said the only way you'd be right for me before me is to believe me. And they instead, it says in verse chapter 10, bumping over there, they instead sought to establish their own righteousness rather than submitting to God's. So we find then Gentiles have a righteousness of faith. The Israelites, who were the ones that were that God called out people, he said their righteousness was all by their efforts. And you know, since Adam and Eve, the problem has been trying to be good enough to be God by your own doing. And that's the whole falling is that he wants us to be willing to say, I can't do that. Nothing I can do is good enough to do that, to be worthy of being in God's presence. But by his grace, he says, all I'm asking for is you to acknowledge that, but then say, and I believe that Jesus is good enough to be in God's presence. Okay, so verse 4 of chapter 10, finally he says, Christ then is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So his point is, okay, we've got the Israelites, oh man, my heart beating for them. I wish that we could get them in on board here. But we've got these Gentiles that are accepting by faith. Oh, you know, what really has happened here is that all of them that will be by faith are in the same boat. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or if you're Gentile, which is what he says down in verse 12 of Romans 10. So there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. You know, a few years earlier, Paul never would have said that. That was just totally foreign to his way of thinking and his upbringing, his training, everything that he'd been taught. But for him to say there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, the same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a dramatic, wow kind of a statement. And you did this last week, so I'm hoping you came away with, with yes, wow, this is the hope that we have coming from this. And so part of his point here is then that it's all that will believe will have the same version of righteousness. We're not going to have the Jewish version and the Gentile version. You're not going to have the pre-Christ version and the post-Christ version. All who have the faith to believe what God has said will be in the same category. And so in verse 19 of chapter 10, finally about to get into where we're really supposed to get here, he says, I, again I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. They had been told to expect this, is what he's saying. The scripture told them that God would use the Gentiles to make them envious. The Gentiles who just don't get it. The Gentiles who are the heathen. The Gentiles who don't know God. The Gentiles who have nothing. But through them, he was going to make the Israelites come to realize something. What were they to come to realize? They already knew God. They were worshiping God. They had the sacrifices of God. But they only knew their own righteousness. They thought they could attain their presence in, uh, in the sight of God by what they were doing. And in chapter, in chapter 10, verse 21, finally then it ends there, chapter 10, but concerning Israel, here's what he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. That's where he le left us at the end of the last chapter. He starts the next chapter 11 then, I ask you this question, did God reject his people? It sure looks like, it could be thought of like, he was going along, doing it a certain method. You had the whole temple system. You had the sacrifice system. You had the priesthood going. You had all of this happening. And it, he rejected them and said, I put you away. I'm going to go find some more people that will believe me. And I'm going to go to the Gentiles. It kind of looked like that. Okay? And Paul is now, he's asking the deeper, harder questions here. And he's saying, is that really what happened? Did God reject his people? And how does he answer? What does your version say? By no means. Somebody else's? Is that NIV, I think? Absolutely not in some of them. Anybody got a King James? Or an authorized? God forbid is how it interprets it there. Did he reject his people? No, absolutely not. 
God forbid. It won't be that way. Uh Uh-uh. Why? Because God made a promise to his people. And for him to reject his promise means he just went back on his word. Uh Uh-uh. He's saying, no way will that happen. So if we are thinking that's what happened, we're mistaken, and perhaps we don't understand deep enough to see what it is that he's actually accomplishing here. So his point here in chapter 10, at least the first half of it, is to answer that question. Did God go back on his plan? Did he go back on his word? Did he reject his people because they weren't going to be good enough and go get somebody else? You know what? The whole point of what he was doing here, just kind of throwing your hint in, is he was trying to point out you're not good enough. He did that on purpose. He even says toward the middle part of this chapter, he blinded them so that this would be be what happened, so that they would have to be faced with a realization we're not good enough. We don't understand well enough. We can't accomplish good enough. All these things is part of his whole point. So what's his argument? The end of verse 1, he says, okay, here's, here's argument number one. I'm an Israelite, and here I am, chief evangelist out here spreading the word. I'm an Israelite doing this. I'm not a Gentile out spreading the word. God chose me to go tell the the people about Jesus. And I'm telling them as an Israelite. I didn't denounce my Israeliteness to do this. I didn't say I'll no longer be that anymore. He still is. And he said, oh yeah, by the way, uh, Peter, you heard of him? He's an Israelite. And I'm pretty proud of being an Israelite. And, and, And you go to James and you go to John. And there's a whole list of them. There's 12 of them that are pretty popular. Okay, They're Israelites. God took these Israelites to continue the message. And so his his point then, I'm an Israelite. I can trace my descendancy. First I go to Abraham, all the way down to the tribe of Benjamin. I have not turned away any of that. God is using the Israelite people, even the nation, to spread the next portion of the understanding of what he's doing. He didn't change his story. He just got through quoting these verses that talked about the Messiah was going to come and, and so forth. And he just got through you know, pointing out that this is what's about to happen, and here it is. And the Israelites are spreading the word to the world. So nothing has really changed except that a whole bunch of them haven't accepted it. But he says he's going to go about that point of it to say, but that's not unexpected. Uh, haven't we had a lot of times in our history where the masses were confused? And there were a few that pushed us forward to the next step. I mean, you go before the Israelite people, people like Noah, though. I mean, he was the few. <laughs> you know, the, the masses didn't accept. Abraham was not the normal. He left his people, Isaac and Jacob. And you go down the list, and then you go through Moses and Aaron, and you go all the way down, you get into the prophets and the kings and so forth. There were usually, the masses were thick-headed and, and stiff-necked, and they were just difficult. And he's telling us here because God made them difficult, because he wanted them to realize it's not because you're so smart that I picked you. It's not because you're so so holy that I have picked you. You are the stubbornest people, he is saying. Well, he's probably saying that about us too, right? He's picking the stubbornness of people to be the ones to bring the message so that nobody will accidentally think, well, it's because I, I, I'm like them that I get to be in to the club. No, he's saying, nobody wants to be like you. <laughs> to be in the club, I don't mean that in any way to put down the Israelite people, okay? God has used them in a mighty way, but not because of their being willing and the masses of them being in the right all the time. It was usually the few. And so Paul is basically saying it's the same now. But don't think that there's nobody. I mean, there's, there were 3,000 mostly Jews that were converted on the day of Pentecost. Okay, Thousands of Israelites are spreading the word that God, through his people, the Israelites, are telling you about the Messiah. So he's saying, no, it's not rejected. He hadn't even stopped this, the message. He hadn't even stopped with what he was doing with those people. But it's the few. And so... God did not, in verse 2, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. And he throws in that little bit of that, whom he foreknew, that I think what Paul is doing here is saying, okay, um, this wasn't something God's just doing on the, on the fly. 
it was planned this way from the beginning. And so he definitely he knew those 3,000 people that were going to be the first ones to be baptized in Jerusalem on that day. He knew that they would be the ones that would be the, the Israelites that were going to go forth. He knew that that was the plan. So let me, you know, so Paul says, let me tell you about an example. And you remember Elijah. And everybody knows the story about Elijah and so forth. And he's just done these wonderful things. You know, you can call down fire and burn up sacrifice there and then taunt the enemies that don't know God, things like that. But then Elijah goes over here and he's just feeling so desolate and lonely and frightened in, in, in verses 2 through 4 there. He says, don't you know what the scripture says about Elijah? He appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they've killed your prophets. They've torn down your altars. I'm the only one left. They're trying to kill me. That's kind of like what the Christians are thinking about Israel right about now. You know, they killed the Messiah. They persecuted us. They killed Stone Stephen. They ran us all out of town. And no matter where we go, they keep coming after us. Paul did that himself. You know, he knows all about this, right? And it's just, you know, there's only the few of us. And he's saying that's the feeling, but Paul, I mean, God told Elijah, oh, don't think you're all by yourself. Don't think it's over. I happen to have already picked out 7,000 that haven't bowed to Baal. They're worshiping me just fine. You didn't even know it. You didn't need to. You didn't have to know it, but they're there. So why does Paul tell them this particular example? I think what he's saying to them is, don't think at this point in history that it's any accident. Just like that, God knows exactly which Israelites he has touched to give them that faith of Abraham such that they will be the ones spreading this message. They're the remnant. They're the few. But they're there. And the four new part of it is basically saying, and it's part of the plan. Don't despair. Don't think that it's all going downhill, and this is about to fall apart, and it's not going to work. He's basically saying, this is perfect. This is right on track. This is exactly what's supposed to happen. Because we've got those Israelites that have believed that are spreading the word on behalf of the nation of Israel. So God assured him, uh, Elijah that this was all in the plan. Paul assures Israel, this is all in the plan. Verse 5, so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. So he's saying, just like Elijah, we've got the same situation. We have a remnant also. Chosen by grace. He goes into this a little bit of a, kind of a side story here, but it's the main story in, in, in reality in verses 5 and 6. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were grace, it would no longer be grace. So what does it mean? God is basically saying that it's his doing, not because even this remnant of believing Israelites, those who believed in Christ, not because they were smart enough to believe in him, or they were humble enough to believe in him, or they were good enough to be the ones. that He didn't pick them because they were good. He didn't pick them because they were the good spokesmen. He picked them because, you can put this in two ways, he picked them because they believed him, but you could also put it that he picked them because they would believe him, because he would cause them to. And that was part of his point, is that the ones that are believing are the ones that he caused to believe. The ones that didn't believe are the ones that he said he blinded them. And if you have a hard time with God blinding them, go back to the previous couple of chapters. You remember about the potter and the clay, and we covered that part, right? Who are you to answer back to God? No, he's doing this, and it seems hard for us to sit, for him to be saying, I blinded them and I made them where they're, they're dense, and they're just not getting it because I want it to be very clear is not because you have the smarts to be able to do this. Okay. God did this on purpose. He did it this way on purpose to prove a point, let's say, about grace. He's saying it wouldn't be grace if they did it, that got in, or they believed that they did something because of their status, their birth record, because they had, they had you know, successfully gone so many days without sin, or anything like that. It would have been the wrong reason. So he did it to prove a point about grace. He did this on purpose to prove a point about self-righteousness. You can't get there yourself. He did it to prove also a point about defeatedness. 
There's nothing you can be, have done that is so bad that you can't by grace come before God and say, I believe you. It goes both ways. The one who wants to say, look what I've done, he says, that's not right in my sight. The one who says, I can't possibly have done enough, he says, that's not what I'm looking for either. Because neither of those keep you from just simply believing God has said my son has died for me. And that's what he wants. So he did this on purpose to prove a point. Now, you have a theme on the outline of this whole series on Romans. Um, justification, hope, the gospel, and our transformation. Have you all been pushing that or talking about that regularly enough that you recognize those words? Or is that just something that he's going to say? That's something on the top of the page there. Justification, hope, the gospel, and our transformation. God did what he did through Israel on purpose, basically for those reasons. Justification, so that they would understand that your justification is by grace, not by birth into a nation of Israel. He did it so that there would be hope. It's despite your sin. For Israel is your example of full of sin when they should have known better. And they were the ones that rejected their Messiah when they were the ones that should have known better. And yet God didn't reject them as the people that are going to be the witnesses to go before the rest of the world. On purpose to prove this point then about the gospel, this is the good news. I mean, when you start into a chapter like this, it's easy to think, you know, this is kind of depressing. The Israelites are doomed. I mean, they didn't make it. They, they failed, and Paul's just all upset about them failing, and they sought their own righteousness. And not really, actually, what he is saying is, this is good news, because he didn't wipe them out like Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, I'm holding you blind for a little while here, but you're still my people. Now, in the big sense of the picture, they are his people by faith, the same as the Gentiles by faith. But Paul is also talking about here pretty bluntly that, yeah, I'm even talking about the physical nation here that God's got purpose for them. They are the descendancy, and they you know, the ones that God has used. I'm not going to get deep into, you know, we therefore have to treat current day Israel in some special way because that's somehow the way, only way. I mean, don't get back into thinking that's the only way you're going to get to God. That was the point. <laughs> they aren't your only way to get to God. What they have given you to get you to God is faith and that message of faith. Okay, let me see if I can get close to wrapping this. Did God reject his chosen people? No. What he rejected was unbelief. What he rejected was self-righteousness. What he rejected was their choosing to find their own way of righteousness to satisfy God. What he rejected were all those things that are the same things he rejects with the Gentiles, the same thing he rejects from the time of Adam. But his people are still his people. He still claims them. And he's saying, and I've got a remnant of them right at the moment that are doing the, the, the hard work of being my witnesses as Israelites going forth and doing it. It's important to notice that in all of this that God's promises are not just to individuals. He does deal with you as an individual, but he also deals with the group. And so Paul is talking here about God wanting to deal with the nation of Israel. And they've got a bigger understanding, the nation of Israel in the spiritual sense, those who have the faith of Abraham, that's the church. And he treats you as a body, not just as an individual. Thus, you have all the scripture that talks about the importance of the body and each part of the body functioning and not neglecting getting together as a body and all that because he's not going to give you everything you need as an individual all by yourself. He's going to help give what you need through him and her and, and all these other people and it's all an interaction kind of a thing. And he's saying, and so it is with Israel. He wasn't ready to abandon that group and say, I've rejected them because he made a promise to Abraham that through them all nations would be blessed. Not just that through Abraham all nations would be blessed, but through your offspring, through your descendants, all nations will be blessed. Okay, we're at the point where I either have to give you a quiz or I have to say the bunch of nothing. <laughs> Note that he goes into that they're blind and they're deaf, being blind and deaf does not take away who you are. 
doesn't change that they are to know Christ, that he is doing something there. What he is doing with the mass of them at the moment there is demonstrating what will not get you by faith. And we needed to see that part of the picture. And then he's demonstrating to one remnant of them, this, though, is what will get you by faith in Christ. And that's faith in him. But on all, he's demonstrating to all of them. Now, the rest of the chapter is going to ask the next question. Have they stumbled and fell beyond recovery? Okay, we'll get into that one next. But just because they were blind and deaf doesn't mean that they, they are not his people. It says in verse 8 through 10, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see, ears that could not hear to this very day. And David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block, a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. That sounds like a curse that David is saying there. But what he's, Paul is doing in quoting it is saying, this is no different than it's always been. These people have always been blind and deaf and, and bent and hard to deal with and stubborn. And ever since, they, oh, take us back to Egypt where we had leeks to eat and it was wonderful. Yeah, it was wonderful back in Egypt. And they, they so quickly forget. God picked them on purpose to be our example. If that's you and me, that's not the part that gets you access to God. That's not what makes you righteous in his sight. Don't feel sorry for the remnant. Don't feel sorry for the fact that there is a remnant. Don't feel sorry for the fact that there had to be a remnant. It was God's plan. And it's a good plan. And it's an on-purpose plan. So though this chapter makes us feel, like, oh, Israel, Israel, oh, Israel. Yeah, there's that aspect of it. But it's a chapter of hope because Paul is basically saying, has he rejected them? No. Have they fallen beyond recovery? Guess what? He says, no. <laughs> and he says, and points out that there's some great things going to happen yet here with them and so forth. The remnant is part of his plan. Paul was a remnant. The apostles that went out were the remnant. The, the early believers, there weren't very many of them amongst all of Israel. There weren't very many of them amongst all of the nations of the world. You can extrapolate this same thing. There aren't that many Christians in the world, in the church. There are churches full of people that are stubborn and ignorant and foolish and doing stupid things and so forth with regard to their faith in God. But there's a remnant. Be the remnant because God has chosen the remnant. The remnant doesn't just choose themselves. The ones that are the remnant don't just decide, well, I'll do this. But if God has said, you're one of the ones that I'm not blinding, that I'm giving you insight, I'm opening your eyes that you can see, and I'm opening your ears that you can hear, and I'm, I'm healing your lameness that you can walk, and he's doing all that with you, then he's basically saying, and so go forth, as one of the messengers of this remnant because you are impelled by his spirit. You are elected by his grace. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says this about the people of God, that you are the chosen people. You are the royal priesthood. You are the holy nation. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And the beautiful thing is, not as a, a new starting over separate thing, you are the people the same as the people that God promised originally to Abraham because he promised it to him by faith. Abraham tried to come up with his own means to have him show it over again. But God, that's not what God says. It is by the faith and God's grace that he made it happen. So this isn't, Peter is not saying it's a whole new, we're starting over. It's the same. We now understand it. But it's a reality that is not just a physicalness. You are his priesthood. We can go forth with a confidence. There's your hope. There's your, it doesn't matter how few of us there are. There's more you don't know about, he tells, it tells Elijah. It doesn't matter because the whole point is, I picked you. I chose you. I gave you the insight. I filled you with my spirit. We're all right on track. 
It's doing exactly what it's supposed to. The numbers aren't right now. I paused on this one because there's one more hand I forgot to say. No, that's it. Let's pray. Thank you all first for listening. Um, Lord, this is deep, and it is wonderful to hear. Wonderful in that it gives us this insight to realize you planned this on purpose. There's nothing of wandering around aimlessly, and though Paul expresses his heart, is that it hurts to see what's happening, and that will happen to us as well. We will feel that hurt sometimes, Lord, just when we we see things that aren't going the way we want in our nation, in our church, in our families. Uh, Father, I pray that you would give us this overriding sense of realization that in that you have saved us. We have nothing to confess to you apart from you and you alone. Praise us as an enabling and a lifting church. In Jesus' name, amen.